My, my name is John O'Brien. Everybody knew me as Jack O'Brien. Uh, I was worked primarily at Moorestown, although I started out in the college relations program and had a few assignments in Camden and Heightstown before I came to Moorestown. What was your location within the division? What was your first? My first location was in, on the college relations program. I worked at Heightstown for about eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I did um, studies on communication links between the Viking orbiter and the lander and between the orbiter and the Earth so that they could communicate and send back whatever information they collected. It was kind of a fresh out of school. I was overwhelmed with what I was being asked to do, but it was kind of stuff I had studied in school, so it, it really did apply. I was able to make a little bit of effort, a contribution there, so. Okay. Um, so what was the first major project that you were able to work on then? Uh, that was the Viking program. It was, a, like I said, an eight-week assignment. It was basically looking at parameters of the communication system, bandwidth versus power versus modulation index to see what was going to be the optimum setting that they were doing. It was a kind of a systems study. It wasn't really hardware or anything like that. Um, so being a freshman college graduate, um, did you have any mentors or anything that... Um, in that assignment, I worked with a fella, uh, his name was Max Fresca, and I'm not sure how that spent. He was a, an elderly gentleman at the time, so I'm sure he's long gone, but uh, he, was, he was very, very uh, able to help me along. If I had any questions, he was very helpful. So you know, that was one of the things I found in general with every, everywhere I worked that if you had a question, there was always somebody that would kind of take you under their wing and help you along. And that didn't matter whether you were entry level or further along in your career. Everybody kind of had a, a mentor at some point. Okay. Uh, how did your career progress as you worked at RCA? Uh, after the, relation, the college relations program, the four assignments, my last assignment was in Moorestown. And I was doing some studies of uh, projecting what the radar return would look like from an array of objects and having no idea what that was for. And after I found out, I can't tell you, but anyway. Um, I did that for six weeks, and then at the end of that relations program, I got, I had the opportunity to, I asked to join Moorestown, and they accepted me as a, as a member, of, uh, associate member of the engineering staff, which was the level, entry level engineering position. I worked in the advanced systems and technology group, and I was working with, several people with years of experience, PhDs and everything, I, I felt I should really be the floor sweeper because I was kind of like the new guy right out of school. But again, uh, the kind of work we were doing was, was theoretical studies of various kinds of communication systems and actually trying to lash them together in the laboratory to demonstrate how they might, they might operate using test equipment and other devices. I did that for about eight years. That program came to an end and uh, I was still a, at that point I had got promoted to member of the engineering staff, and that was like 1978, I think it was, and I was moved into the equipment design group. And I was very nervous about that assignment because I had pretty much forgotten everything I'd ever learned in school. I had never, never really done any design work. I was afraid I was gonna go down there and be out on the street in six months. And a couple of the people I worked with, they said, don't worry, you'll be running the place in a, in a year, so. I went down there and I worked, I was assigned to a program called EDM-4, which is the engineering development model of the Aegis Spy-1B signal processor. I worked on that through the rest of my career in one aspect or another. Uh, I joined them in 78 and by 82 I was a unit manager. Uh, I was responsible for the design of the uh, digital portion of the signal processor related to the detection and burn through processing, they called it. Uh, so I did that for several years through about 84. We, we took it through integration and test at the CSED site, which is the old uh, the Muse site. They converted it to a Navy test site. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's along 295. It's got the ship superstructure on it. Spent three years out there integrating that radar. When that was done, I got assigned to the test team that brought it into production and delivered it to the CG-59, the USS Princeton. Um, that was, uh, and then after that, I, I got assigned supporting the test, production test from an engineering side. In about 1984, I was, uh, I was uh, 
promoted to an activity manager and I had responsibility for all of the signal processing design work, both analog and digital. I had three or four unit managers reporting to me. So it was uh, quite, a, quite a responsibility, I felt. And I, I felt a little out of place because I, here I was in my mid to late 30s and I had people 50, 60 years. They, they probably forgot more about engineering than I ever knew. But again, working with the people, you, you, you develop a rapport and it worked out quite well. Uh, along came GE and they delayered was the famous term at that point where they were getting rid of positions. They wanted only so many steps of uh, management between the top of the company and the, uh, the people work, doing the work, the actual work. And they got rid of that position, but they formed a position called an engineering project manager is what I became. And essentially, I was responsible for all uh, engineering work associated with the Aegis program. Uh, and I was working very closely with the program offices, with the customer. I would be making presentations. So that was kind of a different step. I had been in management where you're more involved with working with the people on a day-to-day -day basis. Now you're kind of stepping out and becoming more of an interface with the customer. And I did that through 1998. So from about 1986 to 98, I was an engineering project manager. During that time, we did a lot of work with taking the Aegis program and doing what we call foreign military sales, selling it to Korea, Japan, Norway, and Spain. And there had to be adaptations made to the radar to allow that to happen. So I was responsible for leading all of the engineering effort associated with that. 1998, I got a call from a fellow who's now a vice president at, at, uh, G, at, uh, Mar at Lockheed Martin, asking me if I was interested in coming over and working in the production program office. The SPY-1 DV signal processor, which was the next generation, was coming into production and they hadn't transitioned anything into production since about 1982. So they needed to kind of rekindle that skill set within the program office. So they brought me over as a program manager and, and I formed a group that did that. And I developed, uh, I had the uh, connections with production, with engineering, so it was kind of a natural fit with my background. I, I formed that group, brought in people with Produ uh, production experience, people with engineering experience, primarily mechanical engineers because they were the ones that ultimately were on the floor getting the stuff built. And um, also with people with a procurement background because there was a lot of new, new, new suppliers that had to be brought on board with this, with this production, uh, with this version of the signal processor. Um, I, did, I did that for a number of years. That went smoothly. And then we got into, uh, they, they kind of assigned me to work on a lot of the new, new programs that were, had a production element, DDG-21, uh, DDX, the deep water program, which was the recapitalization of the U.S. Coast Guard. I spent the last five or six years of my career working very closely as, as a part of a uh, team working on these uh, production aspects of the uh, proposals that went out. We won some, we lost some, but it, all along it was fun. And again, it was working with people both within the company and sometimes consultants that came in. I still have a, a close relationship with a lot of those people. I still stay in contact with them. Do you want to talk about your coworkers a little bit? Uh, yeah, some of the people I worked with, um, when I first started out, I talked about that assignment where we were doing the studies of the radar returns and stuff. I worked with a fellow named Hunter Goodrich uh, I believe at that time he was the holder of all the active engineers with RCA. He held the most patents of anybody who was currently, I don't know what the number was, but I've heard that. And he, uh, he, had a very, he was a very uh, dry man, but he had a very dry sense of humor. We were in a meeting one time and they were arguing over some point and it was obvious that he was in the right. And he turned to me after the meeting, he said, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, because this, this, this group that was arguing was kind of a off, off base and he knew it, but it was a leader that they all followed, so it was kind of, kind of interesting. I also worked, uh, the unit manager I reported to was a fellow named Art Talamini. And uh, he was one of the few engineers I ever worked with that was not degreed. He learned engineering in the, in the trenches. He had worked for Dumont Labs before he came to RCA. 
and I worked for him for about eight years, and, and both as a when I came in as a trainee, and then when I got hired on, I was with him. So, um, some of the other people I've worked with, uh, Joe Volpe, uh, some of the active uh, chief engineers at the time. Uh, as I became got up into management, I worked very closely with uh, with them in reporting status. Bernie Matulis. Uh, most of my experience and people I knew were in, in the Moorestown facility. I didn't know too many in RCA, but since then, I have met some people, a fellow named uh, Marty Grassmiller, I think it is. He worked in Camden. He's retired, he lives near me, and I, we, we kind of hooked up through one of the lunch clubs or something like that and got to know each other, so. Um, so while you were working with RCA, what was the work environment like? RCA, I, I would say, was, was a very, very good work environment. It was kind of a family-oriented thing. They had uh, all kinds of uh, monthly newsletters or magazines that came out. They had pictures of people with their anniversaries. They were very much more focused on that. When, um, and they also sent me to graduate school. Uh, uh, I went to University of Pennsylvania, got in a, a master's degree in systems engineering. It took five and a half years because I was only taking one course a semester at night. But, but they paid for all of that, so that was, was, that was very uh, generous of them, I think. They also had a program that I looked into very briefly. They were looking for um, patent engineers, and they were willing to send you off to law school to become a patent attorney to work for the company. My brother is a lawyer, and I talked to him very quickly about what law school was involved with. He says, a lot of reading and a lot of paper writing. Now, quickly, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to go for that, because that, that wasn't my my forte um, at all so I but the again the opportunities for advancement the uh, opportunities for interesting work very 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 good with, within RCA when when GE came over there was took RCA over at least the defense part of it uh, there was a lot of trepidation because we didn't know what was going to happen were we going to have a job were we going to be out on the street it turned out we got through that pretty smoothly uh, however the next one, when Martin Marietta bought the, the, the business from GE, we didn't even sweat it. We figured we'd been through the tough one. This was going to be a piece of cake. And I like to say, I went through four companies and never changed desks. So I sat at the same desk through all of these transitions. So, um, so we've heard a lot of people talk about the RCA family, and you just mentioned it. Um, with that in mind, what did you have any like relationships outside of work um, that like and coworkers that you would go out with, or um, a lot of people have talked about like the parties, like the holiday parties. Oh yeah, the holiday parties were great. We used to have an annual one. In fact, one of the one of the people I work with left, became a nurse, and she's up in stationed in Alaska now, and and I'm friends with her on Facebook, and we still talk about some of the you know stay in touch with some of the stuff that's going on. Um, the uh, I, I, I belong to a group. We meet for lunch once a month. The re signal processing retirees we, we, around so different places in South Jersey. We meet once a, the third Thursday of the month. We meet for lunch, and I have gone to a couple of the RCA lunch groups, but not too many of them because my my schedule on Mondays is not <laughs> not very flexible. Okay. Um, and. Seeing the influence in South Jersey, would you say that RCA had a measurable impact on the community? I would think so because it was really uh, a family-oriented. Uh, you asked the question earlier about family. If you look at how many people that worked there, where they're, they were maybe the second or the third generation of their family to work there. If a parent may have worked in the factory. The son went to college and got a job as a maybe a, a financial manager or an engineer or something. There was a lot of that. Uh, one of the things that happened when GE came in, they, they didn't like that. They thought it was a little bit too inbred. I think that was very helpful because you kind of grew up with that culture, you understood it and you supported it. And when GE came in, they started to get away from that. They started to see a, a lot of turnover with the new, new hires and they were very concerned about that. They wanted to know what, what, was, what was the driver behind that? And I think part of that was cultural at the time where uh, people, um, they didn't see the loyalty coming from the company, therefore there wasn't a lot of loyalty going back to the company. So if a better opportunity came along for them, they jumped. 
And I don't think you saw too much of that under RCA. And you said you went through all of the transitions through the various companies after RCA was eventually bought. Um, how did you and your coworkers sort of um, cope with all of that? Well, there, there were, really wasn't, we didn't have a lot of uh, things we could do to prevent it. So it was kind of like, you know, one of my bosses said, just keep your head down and keep, keep doing your job and, and, and stay at a, you know, be, be productive. Don't, don't sit in a corner and pout about it. And that, that's kind of what most of the people did. They just kept doing their job. They, they were nervous about what was happening, but they, 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 they got through it. And very, f very few people really lost a job in, during any of those transitions. Uh, except for the people that decided they wanted to leave on their own. When GE came in, there were a lot of people that re took a retirement rather than go through that. I remember that because they were, it was, you know, the people that were close to retirement, they decided to go. And what was it like to retire from a company like RCA? It was bittersweet, I will say. Um, I was, I had planned to retire with 40 years. I was, I would, was 62 years old at the time. And I was going to go in June because that was, would have been my 40th anniversary. I started on June 15th, 1970. And uh, I heard there was going to be an opportunity for a voluntary layoff. So I, but I, I would have had to, I went in February. So it, it meant $20 less a month in my monthly retirement benefit. But I got out early enough that um, I, it worked out very well f personally for me because my daughter, was going back to work and she had a four month old son. So I retired on Friday and that following Tuesday I started babysitting for him four days a week. So that was my new job. I did that for a number of, for two, for four years I had him till, uh, I'm sorry, for two years and then he went to daycare. So. Um, so would you summarize uh, your job with RCA as just an adjuster job or? More than that. It it was a job, but it was more than that because um, if you really want to, I think I enjoyed every day I went to work. There were times where there were days where, like everybody had, you didn't want them, and there were times during some of the integration and test phases we were working seven days a week, twenty four hours a day because it was testing went on all the time, and I remember one day in particular I was working uh, second shift, so I came out of came out at like midnight. It was the winter time. There was a, about a foot and a half of snow and it was still coming down. And I lived about an hour. I live in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. So that's a good hour drive. I look at that. I went back inside and worked another shift and went home the next morning because I, I could envision myself being stuck on the road all night. So there, there were days like that. But in general, I enjoyed the work I did. I enjoyed the people I worked with. And that goes a long way to making life much, much more uh, uh, acceptable in, in terms of some of those difficult, you know, difficult times you have to get through because there were good times and there were, there were difficult times, but th there were a lot more good times than difficult times. So what would you say is the best part about working for, us, working for RCA? Uh, the people I worked with. Um, I, I, I learned a lot from them and hopefully as I became more experienced, I was able to help other people in their transition. Um, when I retired, uh, that was the one thing I, I missed the most, was the people uh, that I worked with. And how about the worst part? Monday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part about retirement is Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, do you have any other like personal stories you'd like to add in? Or um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Something popped into my head while we were talking, and it, it went away. So, um, But in general, I think uh, the, the, I worked with a lot of different people, um, and, and some of them have stayed active as consultants after they retired. I didn't want to do that. Um, personally, what I wound up doing was, like I said, I was babysitting, becoming a grandfather and a babysitter. Um, and most recently, I became involved in politics, which is kind of something I would have never thought to have done. But I was approached about uh, running for borough council in the, in the where I live, and surprising to me, a lot of the uh, skills that you learn as an engineer and as a program manager really translate directly into that because you're running you're running a small town, you're looking at budgets, you're concerned about 
what has to be done. So I, I really didn't, when I first was approached, I'm thinking, I don't really know anything about this. But as I've been doing it now for almost two years, a year and a half, um, I find that a lot of skills that you have that, that translate directly into that, but I wouldn't have thought that ahead of time. Um, as a production manager, did you get involved in any of the sea trials? Uh, only, f I, I did get to ride uh, the, I think it was the USS Gettysburg on what they call Trial Alpha. They tried to get, at one point, people who were involved with uh, the production uh, or the development of the equipment, they wanted to see what the shipyard said. So we did have opportunity to visit the shipyard and see how the equipment was being installed. And I had an opportunity to go out in December in Maine, out into the North Atlantic on an overnight sea trial. And they had me sleeping on an L.L. Bean cot up in the radar room. The legs were between two pipes, so if the ship rolled, it wouldn't slide too far. So it was kind of, but it was, it was a very interesting experience. They fed us on the ship just like they would the, the crew. They had the, the mess thing open. You're walking down a, a, uh, an aisleway and happened to be the time when they were doing high-speed maneuvers where they would go from hard port to hard starboard. So the, and I had a bowl of soup. So you, you know, it was like you were walking like this trying to keep the soup in the, Never mind in the bowl on the tray, you know. It was kind of, but it was it was an interesting experience because it was part of what we we would we wouldn't normally have seen. We we were involved with the, the the assembly and the test and the performance of it, but not the actual use of it out at sea. And I did get a chance to attend uh, one of the uh, christenings for a ship up in Bath also, and it was my 35th anniversary, and uh, I think it was. Uh, trying to remember who it was, Orlando Carvalho called my boss and said, here, here's, send him up there with his wife. So they sent me up for the weekend to, to, to be a part of the, part of the, the uh, christening of uh, the ship. That was, that was an, an, another thing that you wouldn't normally see. What was it like working with your customer? That was kind of... Um, Interesting. Uh, we had we had a pretty good relationship. Uh, it first started during the development phase, where as a as an engineering manager, you would be presenting kind of to the, the internal customer, the production office, and and that. And then when I went over the production office, I knew some of these people, but not not at the same level. You get to know them as a program manager, and that worked pretty well. Uh, the one guy we worked with was Kevin Kenny. He was our direct contact. And I was, a, at that time, was a, a Mets fan, a, a Phillies fan. I had been a Mets fan. He was a big Red Sox fan. So anytime we were together, we'd always be talking baseball as well as, as the, uh, the, the, uh, the business at hand. When I retired, he gave me a Red Sox hat. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, we had a good relationship. But the first couple of times, it was a little nervous because you, you don't know what's going to happen. The one... The, the time I was always most nervous was, was when Admiral Meyer was in the, in the audience because he would, he would come up and he, was a, he could be very brusque and, and I was cautioned that if he starts going on, he's not talking to you if you're the guy on the stage. He's really talking to his staff around him. But that was, that was I didn't only present it in front of him once or twice and I got through it pretty well. But I had been cautioned and warned about that. So it was, it was a matter of getting used to it, I think, more than anything else. Were there a lot of people um, like that that you had to kind of deal with and figure out how to present to? Yes, I had, uh, when I was an engineering project manager, um, I had a, uh, I won't name him, but there was a, there was a uh, chief engineer at the time um, who I would go in to present what I thought was a pretty good story. We were in good shape, things were running well. And he would be all over me about one, he'd ask a question, and if he didn't like the answer, he'd be all over you. Another time I'd go in with what I thought was a disaster on my hand, and said, I'm going to get thrown out of the room or something. And it went very smoothly. So I could never figure him out, and it drove me crazy. My manager at that time was a fellow named John Rakovic, and um, I uh, talked to him about how do I handle that? 
And he said, well, he says, you got to, you know, you do what you can do. I was driving home one night and I started to feel numbness in my jaw and down my arm. I wound up in the emergency room thinking I was having a heart attack and it turned out it was all stress related to him, this individual, because I, I would get so stressed out over it. So, but it turned out I, I got through it, everything was fine. Another interesting story, again, John Rakovic, I was a, a, a unit manager working for him. We were in the middle of tests, so we were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I had a uh, daughter who was in, I can't remember, it was kindergarten or first grade at the time. She took it upon herself to write a letter to him. You know, you remember the paper you got when you were in kindergarten, the lines were about this big, and, and so she, dear Mr. Rakovic, it took her three lines on the envelope to get Rakovic in. And she wrote this letter about how she, she has to, he has to give me more time off because he doesn't, she doesn't see me enough and everything. So I went into work and I gave it to him. And uh, I said, John, I said, I think I got a little problem here. We've got to talk about it. He said, what is it? I said, well, I want you to read this letter. Well, he took a fit of laughing. And when, when he retired, he gave me the letter back. He had kept it all those years. He re, it was like 10 or 15 years later. And I gave it to my daughter and she, she had it framed and gave it to me as a Father's Day gift one time. So. And, and there's a, you asked earlier about what, what the RCA family was like. That was, that was the RCA time. That was the kind of relationship you could have with you. You could go into it and have that discussion and not feel threatened at all by it or something like that. So.